Welcome to the course, Disaster Recovery and Build Back Better. My name is Ram Satish. I'm an assistant professor in Department of Architecture and Planning, Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee. Today, I'm going to talk about self-help housing in Turkey. In fact, this particular lecture has been composed based on the understanding from uh, one of the chapter, which is composed by uh, Hassan and uh, Cassidy Johnson in uh, Build Back Better which was edited by Michael Lyons and Theo Schildnerman and uh, Bono, Camellia Bono. So this is a focus on a particular geographical aspect in the Turkey. And as many of you know that Turkey is uh, prone to the earthquake, frequent earthquakes. And uh, a certain part of Turkey is lying on the fault line. So that is where in uh, we are going to discuss about how the reconstruction mechanisms have worked out, especially in the self-help housing aspect. So they, the authors brought the 1999 Marmara earthquake, Turkey, and follow upon it is um, the which have been affected in consequences as an after after effects. And uh, what you can see here is a huge devastation of this 7.4 richer scale earthquake, which has killed almost uh, 17,480 people. So when an earthquake uh, hits, loss of property damage and uh, you know huge infrastructure damage, that is what one can witness. If you look at the chronological aspects of the major earthquakes in the Turkey since 1970, starting from Gedej, which is about 7.2 richer scales. And then we are again getting in 1992, 1999 in uh, about 7.2 richer scale. And you can see the damage of heavily damaged houses are about 15,000. And in Kokeli earthquake, we same August 17 and November, see that from here in the same 1998, 1999, is a continuously this Adana region and as well as Kokeli and Duxi uh, provinces have been affected, and a huge damage have you can see that 50,000 houses were damaged and 15,000 and uh, almost 655,000 became home homeless. So this is the kind of data which we get in Turkey. We have they also have a disaster law. Law number seven states that the central government it should be responsible for the management of post-disaster activities and basically they have to uh, delegate this particular authority which they call it as Kemakam in the provincial governors in the affected region. So and under this law, there are two categories which they look at. One is the emergency aid immediately after the effect of disaster. Like it could involve short-term recovery, the relief activities, and the provision of temporary shelters, which is a part of the rehabilitation, and also some kind of temporary housing. These are the activities which uh, are looked into under this category. The second aspect is the building construction. In the building construction, which looks at the permanent or the long-term housing reconstruction and the strengthening and the retrofitting of the damaged buildings, and also some key decisions of whether to relocate, whether in situ process. So this is how these are the two categories which the central government looks at. And then based upon the damage assessment, who will be eligible to get a new house? So this law states that they have established a criteria. One is being a homeowner, both legal and illegal constructions can qualify. Let's say when informal settlements have been destroyed, then obviously if it is a tenured or a non-tenured, so they can still be eligible for it. Houses should be badly damaged or collapsed, so the intensity of the damage is also considered. The owner is capable of meeting the repayment terms over 20 years. For instance, if he is going for a permanent uh, reconstruction and if it is through a kind of public-private partnerships or to your loan or credit facilities. So how you can also establish certain housing schemes so that he can pay in installments and to 20 years or so that they will also see that capability. And especially 
due to this major devastation in 1999, this particular law has been amended somewhere around 2000. And this is where that only homeowners in rural areas who live in outside the municipal boundaries would still qualify for state assistance. So which means, so at a central level in collaboration with the state, how they actually also consider the homeowners living in the rural, rural areas. So here where the municipal and building construction supervision exists need to be ensured. So whatever the houses in the urban areas and which are under the uh, pursual of the uh, municipal supervision need to be insured. So the insurance policies also have started drafted and then uh, this is under the Turkish catastrophic insurance pool so that they can receive the compensation. So in that way the insurance idea of insurance so one can invest on the housing insurance especially for the disaster act and so that they can receive some compensation to build a new one or uh, to retrofit that building. So that is how uh, this particular policy have thought about. And most common aspect in Turkey what we see is the relocation. And that how one can take a decision on this relocation. One of the important uh, three criteria they looked at, one is the, when the old location is at risk for the future disaster. Imagine if if that particular old location is prone or it is located on exactly on the fault line or is it in a vulnerable place. So that is where we look at it. And then when the world location is completely destroyed, if it is already and therefore to remove the debris and rebuild on the same site will take too much of time. Imagine it is a huge property and it destroyed. It obviously may take six, seven months to take the whole debris. So in that case, that is where they can look for a relocation so that they can temporarily be uh, located. Or when there is a chance to relocate to land owned by the government, and this is very common, and because uh, this is mostly preferred, so that the government need not pay for the buying the land. So this is what uh, they look for the existing government lands, so that it is, if there is a land available for the relocation purpose, if it is a government land, they obviously prefer for that. In Turkey, there are two different methods of procurement. One is the mass housing and the self-help housing. Let's discuss about what a mass housing talks about. In this process, the government acquires land. And here it is the Ministry of Public Works and Services, also the minister, now it has been renamed, Ministry of Environment and Urban Planning also provides design specifications and also the cost estimations. And these locations are determined by availability of land and safety in terms of earthquake risk. Is it a terrain area? Is it what kind of geog geological conditions do exist? So it's basically the surveyors provide the information. And that is how they decide on these uh, mass de development projects. So that is where a contract, I mean, um, a contractor is engaged and they directly deliver the uh, housing. In self-help housing, where families are involved in the reconstruction on their own land, that is one way, or in a relocated villages. So there are different facilities, like one is they call EYY, and this is about a kind of loan facility. Also the families use the government credits to buy a furnished house, so they take a loan and they purchase. And similarly the house designs as well as the technical and management assistance. Uh, are usually available from the government because the government provides them how to build and what kind of structural guidelines they have to follow. And they disperse, uh, they set up different stages of construction and they say at this plinth level this is what we deliver you the money and this is the sill level, this is what we deli deliver you this part of the amount and this is the completion of the slab, this is the amount. So then that way they distribute it by the stages and in the percentage basis. And also a building contractor would may be hired by the uh, Ministry of Public Works and Services who manages the construction on behalf of the owner. So that is a, a process. Whereas in mass housing uh, approach, there are many issues. One is 
these projects are mainly developed with a general data and because they only talk about yes this many houses have been collapsed and this many uh, uh, farm households has to be relocated. They do not uh, give much regard to the local situation, what kind of environment it is, what kind of um, you know the, uh, the situation of the community, what kind of livelihood they are related to, is it going to affect something of their livelihood, it is going to affect the children's school environment. So that is one aspect. The second aspect is the allocation, allocation process. So the houses are distributed by lottery method like number 56, this is your house, number 52. This. So despite of what kind of uh, settlement it was existed, what kind of neighborhood fabric it was existed, it is all uh, completely uh, taken out due to the lottery approach. So um, here which actually breaks the social bondages because uh, who was living in the old settlement and now uh, they may live with some other group. They may end up with completely different community and that also have a little adjustment process you know that takes some friction between different strangers uh, and for some people it is good but for some people it takes a long time and who have a different uh, religious and lifestyles. It also disregards the preferences and needs and priorities of the affected communities because they are not consulted in the project planning process. Just imagine some woman have died, uh, I mean some woman is left alone with her children and if her husband was died in an earthquake, if he was a businessman and his business was lost, so the, what happens to the woman? So which means a situation have changed from before disaster to uh, the post disaster. So they will not take an account what kind of support she needs. She needs an external family support in the nearby vicinity areas or she needs a good and safe neighborhood, she needs how to run her livelihood. So all these aspects are not given priority because they are never consulted. The design of the houses and the dot facilitate socialize outside which leads you know because most of these either go for an apartment models which are three to four uh, levels which they have to go with the staircases. So earlier they might have lived in a different setup. So that socialization process also gradually weakens. And the payments for these houses often they are too high and especially for the people uh, you know they are not able to afford. So that is where it worsens the conditions of the poverty because they have to end up paying uh, some extra installments and they also have to pay some maintenance bills, individual maintenance bills. So they all add up to a big sum of money. Though the housing units cost the same amount but their value differs depending on the proximity to transport links. Imagine if we are developing two, three different clusters. Let's say one cluster is very close to the highway, uh, the road network and the other two are much interior depending on the land availability. So obviously it value differs. So the person who got a benefit of getting near the road network or the transport facility or a railway station or a metro corridor, so it will be uh, his value, his property value is more uh, higher than the one who, uh, who was staying in the interiors. When we assess the self-help housing reconstruction method, we see that in Turkey, first of all the central government which these ministries and the general director of disaster affairs and with the local governor of the state level, they look at the three different options. One is give them the cash credits, direct financial credits to the homeowner. So what they can do is they can purchase a new house from the property developer. Whereas in the second aspect, we have the provide technical support plus uh, stage by stage you pr give some certain payments on construction on the completion of the construction that is delivered to the home owner and he again relies on the either a beneficially managed construction or it could be he relies on the designers or the building contractors who, who are hired. So in that way that is another process. Whereas in option 3 it is completely a government managed construction. So in this they rely on the contractors, so agency driven 
process and they finish the house and they deliver it to the homeowner. So this is how the self-house mechanism uh, has been conceptualized. And even in this process, there are also, uh, especially um, in the housing process, especially in after the 2000 uh, Chinkari Akira earthquake, there are also some other shortcomings. One is the house designs offered by the government have very little regard to local uh, rural living styles. And while families can choose to use their own design, this entails hiring an architect which the owner must pay for and manage themselves. So even though the family is getting an option to choose their own design, but he has to pay for the architect or the contractor. And here in this process, though the government is ready to give them a training or provide a guidance on how to build a technical support. So, but it takes a long time to educate the owners about earthquake safe constructions and design because it depends on their literacy levels, depends on their social and uh, uh, cooperation, how they come in negotiation, I mean in contact with the government. Also, they need to know some the managerial techniques of how they can manage their projects themselves. And uh, in many cases, it has been noted that contractors run away with some basic deposits and um, maybe having a small verbal agreements with the owners and they run away. So in that way, the whole project leave left incomplete. And there is no involvement of owners in important decisions or whether to relocate or where to relocate and what kind of input, especially in this process. So that is one of the uh, important thing. In uh, GOC province, after the 1999 earthquake, you can see that uh, in the centers and villages and the district, we have the statistical, um, you know, the damage statistics is in providing this table. And uh, the house is constructed through the central government financial support. One is the government mass housing process, which is about 8004. Who is qualified for this? Owner of badly damaged or a collapsed house. Self-help, similarly, it was almost less than half percentage. That is where owner of badly damaged or collapsed house. Whereas the repair and retrofitting process, the 4,874, which is about owner of semi-damaged house, which means it is possible for the reconstruction. So this is where the Turkey Mm, they have realized the essence of the self-help self development process and that is where uh, the new approaches, the new partnerships has been developed. This is where we are going to discuss about three different cases and uh, in the DOST province. If you look at the whole process in the disaster acts or whatever there has been printed, it is mainly focused on whether someone owns something and whether it is lost and so that he can be compensated whether in the form of insurance whether in the form of then what about a renter you know he was not having a house and he was uh, completely ignored so that is where one has to look at how these uh, neglected groups who are basically the renting community and how they are not to be considered. So that is where in Turkey there have been some efforts why various agencies have came forward that yes, we also need to take care of these. Not only the house owners who lost the house, but what about uh, seven, eight tenants or 20 tenants who are living in that apartment? So what about them? That is who becomes homeless. So there are three case studies which we'll be discussing now. One is the Basilar, which is in the Dushu center, the row house, about 168 houses are delivered. Here, there's an international NGO along with the partnership with the local government. The Solidarity Housing Project in Goliaka, which is a detached house, about 57 houses. Here, the international and national NGO plus community plus universities. The Umkar, Juche Peri Urban Areas, which is a detached house, about 220 houses. 
here an international NGO plus the community. So these are the three uh, compositions of the self-help housing uh, process which we will be discussing further. The first case, Joshi Bachelor Houses, Social Housing Project. The International Brook Ascent entered into a cooperation with the municipality of the Duchi and encouraged the Catholic Relief Services to donate about a huge sum of amount to realize a project of 168 houses and a community center for disadvantaged families who were not qualified in the government schemes. So this is where they focused on the small actors, you know. In the whole project management, uh, here what they did was on one side the local government is looking at the land support and the land allocation and the international support is looking at the Catholic Relief Services financial support and they are looking at the permanent houses of reconstruction and University of the Sakraya University is providing the technical support to develop the location plans, architectural and the structural and also the feasibility studies. Whereas a local NGO has been established for after the project for long term development and also uh, who also can look at the maintenance process of it. So uh, this is where um, the communities have actually participated in this process and even in this process what happened was this important uh, some of the criticisms have observed. Families were largely absent from the important decision making of the project apart from what job they would do in construction and how to finish their house. So this is one of the important because they may come from a different livelihood background. So in fact uh, in this whole process they couldn't see much of the public participation because they need to get the technical training and they are not may not be aware of it. And the second aspect is this project was only conceived for 168 households but about 1377 who have applied to be part of the project. See in this process, in the whole uh, process, when you are looking at uh, deliver this kind of project for with the small actors or the rental group, how will you decide on the number of stakeholders? So that is where they started with, um, they invited all these uh, beneficiary groups to come forward to fill the application forms. So starting from the economic, the lower economic background and their existing situations and that is how the priority has been given. And thus they identified only 168. So what about the others out of 1300 odd have applied and who are non-owners and these, uh, they are not uh, complied with these uh, uh, central government or the state government uh, schemes. And also a residence association Bedher was started by the beneficiaries to see the managerial and financial responsibilities of the settlement in the long run aspect. But then still they need the sustained input over the long term to help maintain the organization of the community. And uh, this has actually, you know, while it's not only a delivery, but one has to look at the long term input, how this could be sustained. The second case, Njuchi Golyaka Solidarity Houses Project. Here, the MS Avlery Projesi, which is a Solidarity Houses Project, it was constructed by the Association of Volunteers of Solidarity, AVS and with in partnership in uh, Gladderland Aid of Turkey organization which has collected money from Turkish people living in province of. So they have uh, people who are living in overseas, they have uh, collected certain funds and they have partnership with the housing scheme. And here that uh, they have established certain document uh, kind of memorandum of understandings with the head of the village, each village and also by the mayor of Gyulaka. First of all, the site of the project, it was decided that the houses would be built in the same village boundaries as the demolished houses, that is number one. And the method of construction that the villagers would take an active part in the construction. So here, what happened was the villagers, they also said that at least each family, one person has to be part of it the part of the construction process. And management of the fund, 
The credit is given by the government and those of the donations will be managed by the shared fund administration of one representative from the villager, AVS and the Gladderland delegation and the governorship. So there is a group of one from the community, one from the funding agency, one from the international NGO sponsor and the local governments. So they all are looking at the shared fund management process. Also, the process of decision making all the residents taking part in the term will be represented on equal terms. And the supervision which the Ministry of Public Work has to offer an independent control committee would be assembled from the representatives of the Chamber of Engineers and Architects. So here what one can look at it is like here they were channeled into subgroups. Each family is going to contribute one person for the reconstruction. That way one village will form certain committees and then in, in that whole process you can see that village leaders in collaboration with international NGO and the national NGO and whereas in the government, the Ministry of Public Works and Services who also looked at the financial process of it, the shared administrative aspect. So here the this is also looked from both the ends and here the stakeholders where the universities, the Memar Sinan University, one of the oldest university in Turkey has also provided various uh, technical inputs to the housing project. Also the project professionals, architects and engineers and on the other side you have the Chamber of Turkish Engineers and Architects. So in that way the village teams again they are part of this housing construction process. So if you look at the, uh, the two stages of houses which has been developed, the first stage which you see the red dot and the second stage. So this is a, a kind of a social map of and you can see the, come, the villagers are also engaged in the construction activities. So because it has built a self-reliance when they are building their own home. So during this process they were living in the temporary shelters and it has given them some kind of confidence. Like some of the plans of the stage uh, 1 and the stage 2 and the completed houses uh, this is how they look like. And here whatever the voluntary services have initiated the model where how do uh, the users can participate and they have decided these three reasons. One is the users could observe every aspect of the construction thus guaranteeing the reliability of the structure and safety so that they need to observe every aspect of the construction. It reduces the cost of each house and then increases the number of houses that could be produced through the project. So because you are participating in the labor, initially what they did was they brought the skilled labor and then gradually the training has been supported through the uh, local communities and then they started uh, realizing how it is built. And that's where some of the villages could be trained in construction skills so that they can gradually get on into the construction industry so that it could also open a gateway for the employment uh, process. In the third case, Juchi Umkor houses. Here the United Methodist Committee on Relief of Turkey was engaged in uh, earthquake resistant permanent housing and it has provided for about 220 vulnerable families. And here it has mostly focused on the female headed households and the elderly and the disabled and the families with a large number of dependents with the communities. So it is, has a very definite focus on it. In the earlier case, even they have designated uh, the role of different actors like imagine an uh, old man so he can be acting as a uh, supervision or uh, he can act like a watchman and um, uh, young boys they can be given a different task similarly a female they can be given. So in that way different groups have got designated uh, have been engaged in different aspects someone preparing the food you know, in that way the whole process has been uh, understood and they cooperated with each other. And families who did not have any access to land and uh, they required some kind of only technical assistance and material contributions because neither they have a land and also they don't have an access 
and they also required uh, technical assistance. Uh, so those who have a land but require still some technical assistance to construct their house. So here what they have used, they even gone back to the vernacular housing methodologies and they adopted the local traditional technologies which were even used in Ottoman times and they have started developing a detached housing projects. So uh, in this process the material aspect is more focused and also the community engagement is also when they are is very much uh, active and here you, they are focusing on particular vulnerable groups especially the female headed families or uh, families with a large household size you know that is how disabled so this is how we learnt about three different uh, modes of the self-help uh, housing reconstruction at the end what we have to understand is even within this process the government act or the government will is not the state will is not focusing on the needy that is one thing we have to primarily understand so this is where different partnerships work can work actually together to provide facility for these small actors like i would like to conclude this lecture with a small story I think every one of you know the hare and tortoise story. Once the hare and tortoise kept a race, a mile race, and hot tortoise was walking down very slowly, and then it has uh, uh, just walking very slowly, and uh, the hare almost about to reach, and she thought, okay, I'll sleep for some time. By the time the hare was awake, tortoise have crossed the milestone. In the second rhyme, he realized that it is um, this time I should not sleep. So then it has make sure then the hare won this time. The third aspect, this time the water, the race was in water. But now hare didn't swim, but the tortoise swam and she crossed the target. Now in fourth aspect, tortoise and hare came to an understanding. The hare sat on the tortoise and they reached the milestone together. So here what I mean to say is the partnership between various agencies can bring together and can actually uh, enhance the owner driven practices. Also the agency driven practices, this is where the participation is required and the cooperation is required. I hope uh, you understand about the importance of the self-help housing reconstruction in Turkey. Thank you very much.